Hi, welcome to Everybody Loves Politics. Today we're here with Sally Paulson, who's the Minnesota Independent State Treasurer. We'll talk about third parties in Minnesota and nationally. We'll talk about the election coming up and much, much more, so stay tuned. today with Sally Paulson, who's the treasurer of the Minnesota Independence Party. Sally, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Tom. Now that, that introduction we did, that was, uh, that was not me needing a shave. That was, who was that? That was Indy the... Indy the <laughs> that is Indy the Bison. Um, he has been the Independence Party mascot since 2004, okay. I believe. Um, it was a RCV vote during our caucuses. Okay. Um, those who attended the caucuses decided that between the bison, the hawk, and the turkey, uh, oh. they decided to go with the bison. Okay. And he has been our mascot since, uh, since then. Why a bison? Um, well, number one, it's the only political mascot that's indigenous to North America. Mm -hmm. You've got, you know, the Democrats who have the donkey and the Republicans who have the elephant. And so right. the party decided to go with something that was very American mm -hmm. and that's what they stuck with. So. Okay. Great. So most of you may remember that uh, Jesse Ventura was our governor back in the early, um, or early 19, 19. 1999 yeah. through 2003. Correct. And you worked on that campaign as well, I did. right? Okay. I did. Well, I was a volunteer. Okay, yep. you were a volunteer. Um, so, and it was at, at that time, it was the Reform Party. How did the um, Independence Party become, com become what it is today? Well, back in 1992, when Dean Barkley ran for U.S. Congress against Rod Grams and Jerry Sikorsky, um, it was the Independence Party. Okay. Um, they became affiliated with the Reform Party um, back, I believe, in 2000, and um, were with the Reform Party throughout um, Jesse's campaign, and in 2005 decided to revert back to the Independence Party when they disagreed with a lot of the politics that the National Party was taking. Okay. So uh, they then became more focused on state issues and decided to revert back to the Independence Party of Minnesota. So Great. Okay. that is where we have been since then. Cool, okay. So a lot of people don't know about that. I know you were kind of the primary third party here in Minnesota. Correct. Um, and for the longest time, and we may still be, we're the largest third party organization in the United States. Wow. Either okay. first or second to the state of Texas. Great. Oh, okay. Interesting. Interesting. So um, over the years, you've run candidates other than Governor Ventura. Um, and I know Tim Penny ran for governor, Tom Horner. Correct. Who, who were some names that we would recognize as Independence Party people? Well, Tim Penny um, was probably our first prominent after Jesse Ventura um, candidate. Uh, Tim was a Democratic congressman and um, a very noted moderate. We were thrilled to have him be our candidate back in 2002. Um, after that, we had Peter Hutchinson running for governor. Um, he was a city commissioner in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. uh, then we also had Tom Horner, who ran for us in 2010. Um, and one of the problems that the, the Independence Party has had over the years is being able to uh, maintain our party base from candidate to candidate. Sure. You know, if you look at who Jesse Ventura was versus who Tim Penny was as a candidate, to Peter Hutchinson, to um, Tom Horner, right. it's hard to maintain that continuous party base. You know, the excitement from election to election because you've had, you know, quite the spectrum right. of candidates running for office for the Independence Party. Um, but we've always stuck with our main theme of fiscal responsibility and social inclusiveness. So. Mm -hmm. um, getting people to pay attention to that and to vote for our party each and every time has been a challenge for us. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of institutional reasons why a third party has not been successful in the United States just as a rule. Oh, correct. If you had, you know, if you had a room full of independents right now and who are you going to vote for for president, 
-hmm. it would probably be split straight down the middle, you know, 50-50 voting Republican or voting for Democrats, or, you know, sticking with our grassroots and voting for independents. Okay. Right now there is, um, there are a lot of third party candidates who are running for president, but unfortunately they don't get the money in the media time right. that the major parties get. Right. And that's always been a challenge also. And especially this last presidential election that we're currently in, where 17 Republicans are running, and in addition to four or five Democrats at the time. So you have right. over 20 people running for the major party nominations, you know, and then notwithstanding, there's the Green Party, there's the Libertarian Libertarian Party, uh, the Modern Whigs. Right. Um, shout out to the Modern Whigs. Okay. Um, but the Independence Party, you know, or, or Independence in general. If mm -hmm. you look at what happened in New York, this last primary, if you didn't register as either a Democrat or a Republican, you weren't allowed to vote. It was a closed primary. Back last October was the deadline, correct? It correct. Wasn't, right. it, well, you know, that I don't know. Yeah. But it's, you know, the, the types of restrictions that they're placing on voters now mm -hmm. um, is really detrimental to democracy. And those are the types of things that we want to change. Sure, definitely. So the two-party system is, as you've um, grown up and as you have um, evolved as a um, someone who's interested in politics mm -hmm. over the years, um, have you ever been, are you now or have you ever been a card-carrying member of any other party? Um, no, I haven't been. Okay. You know, I, I voted across the spectrum. Um, being someone who's paid attention to politics, you know, since I was in high school, mm -hmm. um, you know, because you get really excited about voting for the first time when you turn 18. Sure. Um, I couldn't tell you that I voted one straight party line since, since that time. Okay. Since my first election in 84. Mm -hmm. You know, I would have I considered myself a Reagan Democrat, um, and I voted for... <laughs> I've, I've voted across the board. Across the board, okay. So, okay. you know, and the last several years, you know, of course I've voted Independence Party. Sure. You know, I've, I have followed Dean Barkley since 1992. There's kind of a fun story behind that. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us. Well. If you can. Ba I, <laughs> back in the day. Okay. Um, I used to run, which is an affront to everything that independents stand for. Mm -hmm. I ran the employee pack for Northern States Power Company okay. back in the day, mm -hmm. and their employee and shareholder pack. And I used to hold candidate forums for our employees and shareholders throughout the service territory. Mm. One of the very first ones I ever had was in CD6 when uh, Dean Barkley ran against Jerry Sikorsky and Rod Graham. Sure, okay. And he absolutely blew our socks off. You know, we were so impressed with his message, what he had to say, the common sense of it all, um, the types of things that he wanted to correct in politics. You know, one of them was being special interest money. Right. You know, and that's been right. one of the founding things of the Independence Party mm -hmm. is that needs to be changed. Sounds like Bernie. Pretty much, mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're kind of, Personally, I'm really <laughs> disappointed that Bernie didn't run as an independent. Right. But, you know, yeah. when you think about ballot access and the amount of resources and time it would have taken for him to file in all 50 states and territories and stuff mm -hmm. like that, it's an incredible amount of resources that you would have to use. So, right. I, you know, that I understand. I almost feel kind of sold out mm -hmm. that he's running as a Democrat. As a Democrat. Okay. Right. Um, but when Dean Barkley talked about the issues and the things that he wanted to correct and, you know, the corruption in government and special interest money, it's like, wow, this mm -hmm. makes a whole lot of sense. And so, you know, of course, the PAC gives its gratuitous, you know, contribution to both candidates mm -hmm. of major parties because they did it at that time except PAC money. Right. Um, Dean Barkley never at any point in time in any of his campaigns accepted PAC money. Wow. And wow. so, you know, the candidate forum was over and... So he lost. <laughs> well, <is> that, well <laughs> right. this is true. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, your hands are tied behind your mm -hmm. back. If you don't have money and if you don't have exposure and media time, 
Sure. Nobody's going to hear your message. Right. You know, you're not going to get name recognition. So um, the candidate forum was over and we were all getting out our checkbooks and we were writing checks for him. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, he impressed us that much. And from 1992 on, I've, I've been very active in the Independence Party. Now, I was doing some research, uh, Sally, about your party. So I've been, I've been reading up on you. Uh oh. And in 2010, all of the living Minnesota governors um, endorsed Tom Horner. Correct. Who is a Independence Party yep. candidate. He got, I think, about 16, 17%, something like that in the final. Right. I believe it was race. a little lower than that. Okay. But. So even 15%. Um, and I know his, his campaign had talked about, you know, there's Democrats, there's Republicans, and then there's where most of us are. Yeah. I think most of the viewers out there... Um, there's the 60% of us in the middle. We're in the middle. We don't have anyone to represent us mm -hmm. anymore in government. What's, what do you think is ultimately the answer to that? Is it, is it just like other countries do where they have, you know, Brazil has 50 different parties... Uh, or France or these other nations where they have, um, you know, UK has a coalition government where you had Cameron and uh, Nick Clegg being, co you know, kind of co-prime minister almost. What do you think the answer is? And Canada obviously has multiple parties. Well, a lovely representation of the people who are voting in your district. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're looking at, you know, if you've got 60% of the people in your district who consider themselves independent, hey, be a representative on either the legislature or in Congress. Right. You know, and I, that would be a beautiful mm -hmm. thing. Unfortunately, that's not how we are represented. You know, mm -hmm. um, you've got judges, you know, uh, the legislature deciding redistricting, you know, as to where you know, right. your representation is going to come from. Mm -hmm. Well, what is your representation? You know, if, you, if you've got 60% of the people in the middle who consider themselves an independent, we're still not being represented in either the legislature or in Congress. Right, right, okay. And then you've had uh, multiple congressional uh, campaigns mm -hmm. where the person looks like they're doing, they're gonna do great and at the end of the day, it, it, you know, getting toward October, maybe you know the independents are kind of polling well. Ross Perot is an excellent example mm -hmm. of this. He was number one in the polls in 1992. He was above Clinton. He was above Bush. Um, he had a little bit of a, um, I don't know, kind of a breakdown mm -hmm. <laughs> that summer. I think pulled out of the race and then came back in. Right. Still ended Which up was with detrimental. Right. Ended up with 19%. He ran again in 96, and I think got maybe about 12% or something like that. Ross Perot is about the closest we've come, but even in um, you know other uh, the other races, that third party people get to the very end of it and they go, well, I don't want to lose, so I'm going to vote for the lesser of two evils. I'm going to vote for the Republican or the Democrat. Is that people just want to win, so they don't vote for the third party, or what's your theory? Um, the lesser of two evils has become mainstream in party voting and people have become so disenfranchised with having to choose between the lesser of two evils that they're no longer voting. Yeah. If you look at election after election, you know, presidential years might be a little different, but people aren't voting anymore. Right. You know, and you can see significant packs of people, you know, the 18 to 25 who should be so represented in, you know, in polls right now, mm -hmm. but they have the lowest voting, you know, they have the most at stake, well, w some of the most at stake, right. um, but the least voting turnout. And so how do you change that? How do you encourage, you know, groups of people to be concerned about when this decision is made, you're stuck with it for the next two to four years. Mm -hmm. You know, and legislation is going to be impacting, you know, what you're going to earn. College what? tuition or oh, absolutely. things like that. Right. Yep. Uh, you know, your ability to buy a house, your ability to earn a living, you know, a sustainable living wage, mm -hmm. um, you know, your ability to make health care choices. Right. And so, you know, when you're talking about 18 to 25 year olds, 
a lot of them are still living at home or they're in school sure. and they don't have those costs of living impacting them anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, wh you know, I don't know about you, but when I was 24, 25 years old, we owned a house. You know, I had a full-time job. I was getting a, a, an education with tuition reimbursement um, through a corporation. And, you know, these are things that, you know, America is no longer offering. Right, they've chipped Our away youth? at those. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And so I don't know if the laws need to change. You know, kids are eligible for health care on their parents, you know, on their parents' insurance until they're 26. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that when I was young. You know, I went yeah. out and, you know, you probably did the same. You got a full-time job and you were earning a living. Sure. By the time you were 24, 25 years old. And I didn't want to live with my parents, I'll <laughs> tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, um, you know, but I mean, that age group doesn't have that now, mm -hmm. you know, and, and while they could be, you know, they could have had their college education by the time they're 22, maybe a master's degree by the time they're 26, mm -hmm. um, they're not able to contribute to consumerism, I guess is right. for a lack of any other way to put it, because they're not they're not earning a living. They're their paying off their, so student right. their student loan debt. Mm -hmm. You know, my daughter, she'll probably kill me for this, but she has $100,000 in student loan debt. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and as a young married woman, yeah, yeah, they can't buy a house. Exactly, exactly. So what do you do? Those What's are the kind of things that you have to change. And you know, what, what are our priorities in this country? Is it, is it saddling people who are trying to make a better way in life, right. their educational opportunities, and trying to be productive members of society, do we handicap those people, a little bit of editorial comment here, but do we handicap those people by saddling them with $100,000 in debt, mm -hmm. or do we enable them to get the education that's going to contribute back into the economic engine of the country, um, and, and you know, by investing in education rather than um, you know, building more jails? Right, exactly. So that's my soapbox, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> More yeah, of that one later. <laughs> on top of another. Yeah, so there's so much. You mentioned earlier when we were talking, setting up for the show, about some issues that the Independence Party uh, differs a bit from the other two major parties. What What are some issues that we should know about? Here's your Here's your soapbox. What's well, uh, one of the things that we've always stood for is you know fiscal conservatism. You don't, you don't balance a budget by borrowing money from something else just to make the pages add up at the end of the day. Right. You know, if you're going to spend money, you have to find a revenue in order to take its place. You know, and one of the things that we've always, you know, stood for is Sunday sales of all retail items. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's unfortunate that people can't buy, you know, cars or liquor in the state of Minnesota on a Sunday. You know, you can still go bank and you can still buy groceries, um, but unfortunately, these are two streams of income that could be very lucrative for the state. Mm -hmm. You know, and unfortunately, Min Ledge is um, not paying attention to it because of special interest money that is coming in. You know, lobbyists that, right. you know, the, the Restaurant and Bar Association mm -hmm. who is taking care of their business and unfortunately, their voice is heard more than the majority of Minnesotans mm -hmm. who want something like this. Right. You know, or um, years ago, they had the Racino issue where, you know, a majority of Minnesotans wanted to be able to have, you know, slot machines or something like that at Canterbury Park. Right. They felt that this was something that could take care of some of the education issues, you know, mm -hmm. fund education. But unfortunately, special interest groups came in and took care of it, even mm -hmm. though the majority of Minnesotans wanted it. Right. So sadly, this is one of the things that we want to keep pounding home mm -hmm. to voters, is that you need a third party to stand behind you. You know, we, you need a third party to represent what your interests are, not what the special interests are who are, you know, padding the coffers of Democrats and Republicans mm -hmm. re-election campaigns. How about something like uh, marijuana legalization? Um, again, I, I said that we are for, we are the only party in the state that um, endorsed the 
uh, regulation, taxation, and legalization of cannabis. Mm -hmm. We also support um, the ability for agriculture to um, produce industrial hemp. Okay. Again, you as know, a fabric. Absolutely. Okay. You know, it's it's a major crop that mm -hmm. farmers would be able to you know to produce, and so it you could smoke your shirt basically. <laughs> No. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I know I it doesn't work so. that way. No, but, okay. you can't bake it into anything. Right. Um, okay. No, that would be that would be kind of hard. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, that's the kind of things that our party looks at for common sense. Sure. You know, not only the decriminalization of marijuana for you know obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're we're pretty standard with liberal, more liberal leaning parties on that, or right. libertarians who you know. Um, get sure. out of my household. Um, right. But we tend to pick up those issues and advocate them that most people believe in, mm -hmm. you know, and most people will go to the polls for. That's for. 60 percent. Absolutely. Yep. And those are things that we've stuck with over the last several election cycles. You know, we kind of find that we're more issues based than actual candidates. Right. You know, because right now, as a minor party, mm -hmm. we have the challenge of coming up with um, signature petitions for each and every one of our candidates so who wants to run for office. You don't have that automatic ballot access any Correct. longer. Correct. Okay. And the threshold was, what, 5%? Correct. Of the vote? Okay. Yep. Something like that? All right. Well, that, that is definitely a shame that you lost that um, here in the last election. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. But, um, but you know, it, 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 could, it could turn around here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have hope. We're going to be here. We're going to be here right. for a long time. Well, if you know, if you uh, and you do wear the mascot head, correct on occasion? I do. Not yep. here on the show, but no, nope. out at the state fair. The I'll, state I'll fair. send you pictures. It's okay. legit. All right, good. Oh, you might not know it's me. So you could shake uh, Sally's hoof <laughs> at the state fair. <laughs> at the state fair. And uh, and say hi to the Independence Party people that are out there. That's uh, right. We have our stationary booth on the. Uh, southwest corner of Dan Patch and Underwood. We're right okay. next to the cheese curd stand and the french fry stand. So stop by and see me uh, sometime I'll, this I'll summer. I'll probably be there. <laughs> all right. If it's near the cheese if curds it's, it's right next door to the cheese curds stand. And we'll, we'll think of you broiling in there in 95 degree temperatures. I will hook you up with some curds. Okay. Sally, thanks again for coming on the show and uh, we'll be right back. So here's a thought. When was the last time you rushed home to watch the evening news or sit down to read a newspaper to catch up on the day's events? Of course, with few exceptions, those days are long gone. Today, we're blessed to have a 24-7 news cycle, smartphones that let us know instantly when breaking news happens around the world or when our favorite sports team wins a game. It seems we're never too far away from a TV monitor featuring talking heads discussing the latest campaign happenings or xenophobic uttering of Donald Trump. Case in point, as anyone with small children in the upper Midwest knows, one of the top places to take kids is a water park, either at a local hotel or somewhere like the Wisconsin Dells. Now these are places where you'd think parents should be able to go get away from it all, have a few beers, sit in the hot tub, and let the kids play for hours, right? Well, on one recent trip to the Dells, I was disappointed to see that they had installed numerous TV screens throughout the park. And they were all showing news. In fact, it was news related to a recent terror attack at a resort. Something you really don't want to ponder when you're sitting at a resort trying to relax. While we'll never be going back to the days before Twitter, the web, and round-the-clock news, I'm hopeful places designed to provide a respite from the world's troubles will start to use some common sense and not flood us with so much negativity around the clock. After all, sometimes you just want to tune out all the political news going on, even if you're a nerd like me. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Everybody Loves Politics.